word serve happy Father's Day. That was almost as much excitement as the first time around. I was just testing to see if there was any difference. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. We're continuing our series on the book of Philippians. So there are four chapters in Philippians. There are four sermons in this series. You do the math. If you read one chapter per week, you would be catching up on everything that we're doing. So I would encourage you to do that. The subtitle is Contagious Joy. And I want to highlight that because while the print is little, the idea is huge. We have a source of joy this world cannot give and this world cannot take away. We need to be contagious because as I look at the world, it could use a little joy. I'm just saying, maybe you know some people, maybe you are some people. We have a source of joy and I want to tap into that this morning. And I want to ask you by asking this question. Are you living a worthy life? Are you living a worthy life? Because that brings joy. Where we've been, uh, last week we talked a little bit about the unstoppable. This week we're talking about worthy. And then next week we're going to talk about how to press on even when times are tough and joy seems hard to reach. And finally, we're going to end up in a place of peace. And not just any peace, the peace that passes understanding. So back to today's question, are you living a worthy life? And I know what you're thinking. You Well, Bill, I could go a million different ways. What do you mean by worthy? Like what part of my life should I be living worthily? I don't think that's a word, but it is now. <laughs> so one of the things that, you know, on Father's Day, you might automatically go to, well, am I being a worthy father or a worthy parent, a worthy mother? Well, you know, there's, there's a difference between what society will tell you and, and what this book will tell us. And that's worth pausing and thinking about today. Because society will tell you to be a worthy parent, you've got to have your kid involved in every activity known to, to humankind, right? Uh, you've got to provide. And so sometimes that provides, it's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that any things are bad. But in excess, these things can actually not be optimal. Let's just put it that way. So yeah, provide for your family. But if that shows up as workaholism, if you're never present with your family, you never have the opportunity to interact with your kids, and, and pass on your values, your belief in Jesus Christ and your walk? Is that the most effective use of our time? Are we living the most worthy life that we can in those circumstances? I understand that life is busy and there's a lot of things going on. I'm not railing against let's just cut it all and, and, and throw out the baby with the bathwater. What I am saying is fathers and mothers, there's opportunities, golden moments throughout the day, little threads that you can pull through that day that show your faith to your kids. Some of them involve words. Most of them involve actions. It's either what we do or, or we don't do. And that's going to be the biggest thing that they remember. I, I know this because my kids continually point out things that I used to do. That's what Father's Day is all about, right? <laughs> and you think that they're not listening? Yeah, they come back with exactly what you said when you don't want to hear it. That's just the way this, I'm just going to spoil it for you all. That's the way that this works, right? So am I living a worthy life as a parent? Well, the, the society will tell us that you have to do certain things. You have to have your kids involved in everything. You have to the work, provide, all that kind of stuff. But maybe there's another way. And I think there is. Paul's going to talk about that. Uh, on this uh, day also, it, you know, we may be thinking, well, you know, Flag Day just happened, June 14th. So maybe you mean am I being a worthy citizen of the United States? Uh, maybe that's my worthy life. You know, the, all, all the things that we do for, for our country, for our nation. Again, taken to extreme can be bad things, but generally good things. You know, do I do, I do all the right things? Am I, am I doing what I should as a citizen? Am I participating in society? Am I contributing to society? Am I engaged in society? Because it's easy not to. Right? The, the social media, the, the distance that we put between personal relationships anymore, make it very possible for us to be proxy citizens. And here's the thing with citizenship. Everybody wants the rights of a good country. I want the rights. I want the freedom. But when you pick up that stick, on one end is rights, on the other end is responsibility. See, nobody wants to pick up responsibility. But we have to if we're going to continue to enjoy the rights. These rights, these freedoms aren't just given to us. They are paid for dearly. Uh, we just came out of Memorial Day, so we know all about that. You've heard the phrase, freedom isn't free, and it's a trite phrase, but it's true. Somebody paid dearly for it. And in our case, somebody paid very dearly, sent his only son to die on a cross. Maybe you've heard of this guy. His name is Jesus. He's kind of a big deal around here, right? Somebody paid for that. 
So if we're going to live lives worthy of this in our country, then we should probably engage. We want the rights. We want the freedom from sin and the power of death. But do we want the responsibilities to walk beside Christ? We want the freedoms that our country gives, but are we willing to take on the responsibilities that provide those freedoms? We want to be good parents, but are we willing to take on the responsibilities of good parents, or do we just try to hand those off to someone else? Now, I know that's nobody here. I'm just preaching to your friends so that you can go tell them this, right? (laughs) But that's what we're up against. How do we do this well? How do we live a worthy life? And I'm going to bring up the, the graphic from last week because it's so cheery. I just had to share it twice, right? So this is church attendance, or membership, rather, in, in a church since they started measuring this in 1937. And for the first time, we've dropped below 50%. And the reason that I show this again is if we are living a worthy life of Christ, if we are representing Christ well to the world, then why are these numbers going down? Shouldn't they be going up? If we're living genuine, authentic, and I'll use the word again, winsome lives i know that because some people just don't like that word so i'm going to keep using it that's that's the way i work winsome lives means it's attractive i don't know what you have but i want that how do i get that and that's what i want to talk about today how do we get that so these numbers do not look good we talked about that last week but i have hope that they're going to look a lot better because of who i see in front of me today We're going to go into the work of Paul. Paul is my kind of guy. Paul is on mission no matter what happens. There's nothing that phases Paul. I mean, how many people in prison, in stocks, at midnight have a praise and worship service? I'm just saying. He's out there singing. So here's the thing about Paul. He is all about the mission. Last week we talked about how much thanks and and, uh, thanksgiving he had in his heart for the people that came alongside him to spread the gospel and how grateful he was. And he's writing this from prison, right? So, so you would think if my mission is to spread the good news and to live in a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I would have to be out there doing what Paul did, planting churches, preaching, getting thrown out of town, left for dead, you know, all the things that Paul does, right? But he's in prison. Now, it's, hard, it's easy for us to look back and go, yeah, that's Paul, though, you know? He's just a, a different kind of dude. But what about us? What is it that derails us from living a life for Christ? Oh, you know, I'm a little under the weather today. I don't think I can do anything for Christ. Um, You know, I'm really busy in this season of life. I don't think I can do anything for Christ. It's not an either or. It's how do I fit this in? So we have the, the, the challenge. I either try to fit Jesus into my life or I try to fit my life into Jesus. You tell me which one honors him most. So... Paul, the reason I love him so much, he's in prison. And what does he do? Uh, He writes most of the New Testament, right? He's not being slowed down. We have all this because Paul was in prison. If he hadn't been in prison, he would have been out there preaching. He's not writing down while he's preaching and being thrown out of town left for dead. You can't write. His hand's broken, right? So he writes this from prison. Nothing stops him. Now that's a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The other thing that's interesting to me is that he's in Philippi, right? The city of Philippi, the colony, is a Roman colony. It's the site of a great victory uh, fr- from the Romans, and they made this a Roman colony, which gives it special privileges, like they don't have to pay taxes. And if you're a veteran, you get free land. So there was a ton of veterans, Roman veterans, living in Philippi. I kind of like that idea. I think I'm going to propose that to the city council. I'm just saying, right? <laughs> So they're very patriotic about their, their nationality, their Romanness. They're very, um, they, they show great pride in the, the patriotism and the, the rights and privileges that they have as a Roman colony. And maybe rightfully so, maybe not. That's up to you to decide. But they're very proud of their citizenship as Roman colonists. In that context, Paul writes these words. Uh, and in further context, let me just build a little bit more. After he gives thanks for the people that are working beside him, he goes full into the fact that he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He might live. He might not. He might be executed. In spite of all that, he says, now, you know, I know I'm off the market right now. I know I'm in prison. I know that there are people out there preaching Jesus Christ, and maybe they're doing that even for selfish gain. But you know what? Christ is still being preached. 
is this guy twisted or is he brilliant? I'm not sure. But he recognizes that even if it's not him, somebody is preaching Christ. Even if the motive is not pure, Christ is still being preached, and Christ will sort himself out. However he gets preached, he has a way of sorting himself out and speaking truth into life. His word never returns void. So Paul sees this all as gain. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. He even says, well, to live is uh, Christ, to die is gain. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And now we're ready to hear these words that he writes to the church of Philippi. But he says, whatever happens. Sorry, I forgot to advance the slide with a magic question. There we go. How can I live a worthy life is what I want you to listen for as you hear these words. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you uh, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. These are the words of God for the people of God, and for these words we are grateful. Paul says, no matter what happens, no matter if I live or die, no matter if somebody preaches Christ for the wrong motive or the right motive, no matter what happens, live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Talk about someone who paid the price. A man died for that. The least that we can do is to attempt to live a worthy life. Does that mean that we earn it? No, that's the beauty of it. Here's the irony in this word worthy. I am not worthy. I hate to break it to you, but you're not worthy either. But yet, God in all his love and grace sends a son. And through his gift, we are worthy. How can we not attempt to live a worthy life in return once we understand that? Now that's the key. That's the key to the whole thing. So how do we live a worthy life? Now, interestingly enough, the wording here, I don't usually Greek out on you guys, but I am today. Because the word uh, the, to live in a manner, the, the Greek word that he uses there has a derivative towards citizenship. So in essence, he's saying, how do you live like a good citizen? In fact, in some of the translations, like if you look at the New Living Translation, it will say, uh, live a life as a worthy citizen or something sort of like that. And we know that that's similar because in chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, are we citizens of heaven or citizens of earth? All right, so this idea of citizenship stands out in the way that we live a worthy life. Why is that so important? Why am I making such a big deal? Because it's one thing to know book knowledge. It's a whole other thing is to say, how do I live this out? And citizenship is how we live this out. So to be a U.S. citizen... Boom. I love this question. Could you pass a U.S. citizenship test? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to some people who are not naturalized citizens. They weren't born here. They, they earned it the hard way, right? And they were asking me some of the questions that were on the test. I was like, ooh, I should have paid attention in school. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I know that. Yeah, they're telling me more about my country than I know. I, there's a little bit of shame there. I'm going to be honest with you, right? So some of the, the uh, things that are required just to be a U.S. citizen, I'll throw these out there, are physical presence. you got to live here if you're going to be a citizen. doesn't make sense if you're not. You also have to have good moral character. Uh, they missed me. But anyway... <laughs> How do they know that, right? I mean, they got to do some background checks. And this is actually one of the biggest complaints from the border these days is that some of these countries are sending people and then blocking the information about these people. So when you go to uh, process a request for citizenship or asylum, whatever the case may be, they go back and they look at that person and they can't find any record whatsoever. That's not suspicious at all. Right? Because if I'm sending you a good person, man, I, it's gonna be, there's going to be a whole resume to go. This is a Nobel Prize winner. You know, there's a scientist and Mother Teresa's uh, son. Uh, uh, no, that's not possible. Anyway, um, but you get the idea, right? So when they block the information, just let that sink in for a second. Yes. <laughs> so they block the information, you know that it's not good. But good moral character was an expectation of the people who made the requirements. In the 1800s, Alexis de Tocqueville was a French uh, visitor to the States, and the French were asking him, why is America so great? Why, what is it about them and their democracy that makes us so great? 
I'm going to butcher the quote, but I'll give it my best shot. He said something like this. America is great because her people are good. And when Americans stop being good, America will stop being great. And he's talking about the moral foundation of our nation, of our forefathers, the ones who attempted to live a life worthy of both citizenship in heaven and earth. Good moral character. Speaks English. Makes sense. If you're going to do business, you probably should speak the language. Uh, civics knowledge. This is where my friends who became naturalized citizens kind of got me in a couple of places. Like, I, I should know that, uh, but I don't. Uh, thanks for filling me in and making me feel bad. Uh, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Right? How many of us are willing to pledge our lives for what we believe? Because if we're not, those rights that I talked about earlier will go away. That's the way this works. I, I don't know if this is news to anyone, but if we refuse to take the responsibility for these rights, they will be taken. You can look at any part of history and see this cycle play out. I pray to God that doesn't happen here. Support and defend the Constitution, oath of allegiance. We take an oath of allegiance to this nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag. And even in those words, you see the words indivisible, liberty, justice, under God, all these concepts that keep coming back that point both to earth and to heaven. Because under God is the only way that we experience true justice, true equality, and true indivisibility. Without it, we're divided. We're like sheep that are scattered. There was a guy who said that once. His name was Jesus. He's a pretty big deal around here. Did I mention that before? <laughs> Yeah, so we take it, this is all the things that we do for U.S. citizenship, but I'm just going to flip the script briefly. Only a couple of words are going to change on this slide, but I want you to see what it's like to be a citizen of heaven, because that's what Paul is talking about, living a life worthy in this manner like a citizen of heaven. <clears throat> you have to have a physical presence. Ooh, ouch, what? You mean you've got to be a part of the body of Christ? <laughs> yeah, we've got to show up. The, the, the church attendance, the church membership graphic. So <clears throat> here's the way I equate that. Back in the day, when they started measuring church membership and church attendance, a regular attender was considered you attended every Sunday. Any guesses on what now is considered a regular attender? Once a quarter, maybe. <laughs> once a month is what the statistics say. I think it's sliding towards once a quarter, though. I think we're getting there, right? Once a month, we get together as the body of Christ. And that may or may not be the same people. So you may or may not be forming bonds with these people. It might just be, oh, that, that's the person that sat next to me six months ago. If you are after a fitness goal and you join a gym and you work out 12 times per year, what kind of shape is your body going to be in? Good. <laughs> Great shape. Yeah, because all we got to do is take a pill. That's how, that's how lazy we are. We're just going to take a pill and make this all work. We don't want to do the work, right? Yeah, if you join a gym and you go 12 times per year, you're not going to be in good shape. So why are we surprised that the body of Christ is not in good shape today? Why are we surprised that less than 50% of the people in this country are members of our gym? And that's assuming that we even work out. It's no surprise. No surprise to me. Anyway, got to have a physical presence. Good moral character. How many people are good of their own accord? Good. <laughs> One. <laughs> and his name is Jesus. No. So good moral character. Yeah, we need some guidance because of our own, we are like sheep that are scattered. Without a vision, the people perish. Another, another translation of that is without rules, people cast off restraint. Our natural tendency in our brokenness in this sinful world that we live in is not to go towards order. It's to go away from order, disorder, dysfunction, disunity. That's what we are in and of ourselves. We need what this offers. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance. Because of our own, we're not that good. And if you disagree with me, let's buy a cup of, a, a, a cup of coffee in a word serve mug, sit out in public, have a faith discussion. And I'll just point to history. I don't even have to point at the Bible, which is full of it, full of good examples. <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> full of good examples. History, the same. 
So you can see it throughout. This is a natural thing that happens again and again. To be a citizen of heaven, we have to speak the native language, and the native language is love. Now, I don't mean mushy mushy love, I mean love that sprinkles in grace, that sprinkles in forgiveness, and yet speaks truth, because speaking truth is also love. We have to speak the native language. I'm amazed when I watch kids' sporting events how good they are at trash talking. Has anybody else picked up on this? Yeah, no, all the kids are like, don't make eye contact with Pastor Bill right now. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you. I've heard you. No, I'm kidding. No, but trash talking is an art. But at the essence of trash talking is to tear people down. What happened to building people up? I mean, if I'm so bad at my sport that I have to tear you down so that I feel better, uh, I should work out more. I should, I should put a little more interest into how good I can get. In fact, I'm going to encourage my opponents so that they do get better because that makes me have to get better. That's the way I look at it. You can call me a preacher, whatever you want to call me, whatever disparaging word you can think of. But I think the world would be a lot better place if we started building each other up rather than tear each other down. And we have to speak the native language of the citizens of heaven. Civics knowledge, how does that work? How does Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go together? What is grace? How does forgiveness work? What is sin? Why should I care? How do I get past my mistakes? How do I shed guilt and shame and live in light and life? All these things are how the kingdom of heaven works, but if we don't understand it, we can't take advantage of that. So my encouragement is that we dedicate ourselves to civics knowledge of heaven so that we don't get embarrassed by some new believer that comes and goes, hey, did you know how this works? Yeah, I've been a Christian all my life, and no, I did not know that. Hmm, man, that might leave a mark, right? But it also highlights the other thing is that sometimes we're born, just like we're born into our citizenship, we're born into the faith. I never knew a time when I didn't know Jesus. I was born into the family of family. I was, I was born into uh, Leave It to Beaver, right? My, my, <laughs> okay, nobody knows who that is. It's like 20% of you know, yeah, yeah. The perfect family. My mom was the backup piano player for the church. She was a children's choir director. Every time the doors were open, I was there. And I took all of that for granted. And, until I was an adult, I, did. I just went through the motions because I, I just thought that everybody had this. This is what you do. It's not just what we do, and it's less and less what we're doing. So civics knowledge would be good. Support and defend, I, I put the Bible up there, but I think maybe a broader category. Support and defend the faith, right? And some people say, well, Jesus doesn't really need defending. He's a lion of Judah. Sometimes though, the defending is an opportunity to speak a different truth into what they think is truth. And we do that with grace. We do that with love, but we still speak the truth. We support and defend the one that died for us basically. But we can't do that if we don't know how. And then finally, we take oaths of allegiance. So in some of the creeds that, that the church has, in some of the scriptures and the prayers, we pledge ourselves to Christ as he first pledged himself to us. So this is, sounds like a lot of homework and a lot of busy work, and that's all fine and good. There's got to be a way, though, because Jesus says this burden is easy and the yoke is light. How do we incorporate this in our daily lives? How do we live this life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ in the spirit? And for that, I need a volunteer that would like to come up on stage with me. All right, Tony, bring it on up here, brother. So, yay, give a hand for Tony. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now he asks what I'm on volunteering for. This is my kind of man, right? <laughs> so we're just going to face out this way. Okay. All right, so all I need you to do is just, I'm going to add, I'm going to do something, nothing dangerous, nothing embarrassing. I just need your honest reaction and how you feel, all right? So, Tony, man, right. yeah. <laughs> so look at these people out here. This is the body of Christ. Do you believe how much talent and experience and abilities there are? Can you imagine if we all came together and started to live a life worthy of Jesus Christ himself? What kind of impact could we make in the community? Wouldn't it be awesome to see us start a wave, maybe even a revival? I know we can't manufacture that, but the Spirit could. Look at these people. Aren't they amazing? Yeah. <laughs> so how are you feeling right now? Pretty high. It feels good. Yeah. Handsome crowd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. I didn't tell him to say that, but you know, you can pay him later, right? <laughs> okay, now, the only thing that's going to change is I'm going to ask you to turn 90 degrees and face me. 
hey, Tony, there's this body of Christ out here, and they could do a lot of great things, but they're not right now. <laughs> See what he's doing? See what he's doing? He's backing away, right? Yeah, so perfect. This is perfect. How are you feeling right now? Uh, a little awkward. <laughs> a little awkward. Yeah, yeah. So here's the cool thing, right? When we talk about this coming together, did you notice that the space between us never changed? I'm just as close now as I was here. Nothing changed, except I'm not facing him. I'm facing you. What's the moral here? What's the lesson? A lot of times when we talk about trying to live a life worthy, we're right in somebody's face. We're telling them, you're not doing the right thing. You need to do this. You need to do that. We're not living up to our potential. But look what happens when we stop worrying about each other and we look at what Christ could do. When we look at the cross, when we look at the empty grave, when we look at the body of Christ. This is unity. And I'm just as close here as I was in his face. But the difference is now we're locked. Nothing can get between us. Imagine a whole line of that. That's a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's unity. We're called to walk side by side, not face to face. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate you, brother. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> So all of this citizenship stuff, all of this living life, actually doing life, this is why we're word serve. We preach and teach the word so we have the knowledge, but we serve the world so we do the knowledge. This is the life that we live. And when we come together and stop worrying about who's going to win, who's going to trash talk, who's got the best Christian trash talk, is there such a thing? We should invent that. No, we shouldn't, actually. <laughs> So we're, when we're up against each other, we're telling each other what to do, whether it's inside a, of a, a group that you're in, inside a church that you're in, inside two churches on the same campus, whatever that is, if we all would just stop and look at Christ and face the same direction, man, that creates unity. That would create, I don't know, one Lord, one mind, one spirit, one baptism, one mission to make disciples of all the world until he comes again. That is a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will you live it? Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity that we have in unity. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that breaks down all the barriers, gives us something to turn toward, something worth living for. God, help us by the power of your spirit to stop fighting with each other, to stop looking for faults in each other, and to start looking at the cross and the empty grave and the promise of life in you. And God, as we do this, as we move out and walk side by side in unity, I pray that your spirit precedes us, prepares the way. I pray that your spirit equips us so that whatever we face in that process is nothing too big for you to handle. And I pray that whatever the future holds, it be one that honors you, that glorifies you, makes your name known so that all the world may know there is a life worth living in a manner worth living it that reflects the very best of you. God, we pray all this for your glory and your honor and in your son's precious name. Amen.